Geltman and Weld on the Hammer Factor. Take it away, the only boys. Thing you find interesting is the timing of this. Yeah, it's just another outside predatory story. <laughs> but I mean, like, that's where I, what I wanted to talk about. Like, it's like I feel like it's, right, well, it's very well written, but it, yeah, it. Uh, welcome yeah. to Hammer Factor episode eighty. We are back. It's been a little bit, a little while. My name is John Grace, producer here at the show. I'd like to introduce my co-host, John Weld, co-owner of Immersion Research, and Lewis Geltman, policy director for the Outdoor Alliance. We've got a lot to talk about. We've got lined up for the show today, I would say hands down, the most beautiful man in Whitewater. Is That's that a, besides you. That's a fair description. <laughs> We have Benny Marr on the show to go into a, a deep dive of all sorts of different topics. Super excited about that one. Um, yeah, what's going on? What have you guys been doing? Well, you've been gone for like a month. I want to make that clear because people are bugging me all the time about when we're going to do a hammer factor. And I'm like, well, it's when Grace gets back from sabbatical or whatever you call a break <laughs> for this long. I mean, it's not a vacation. It's something else, right? It was, it was, it was five weeks of bliss is what it was. Back in June, I bought our family ski passes. Um, kind of had this idea, and you could get a refund by November. So you could buy the passes, and you could get a refund. And so I just went ahead and bought them. We took off, loaded up all the kids, all of our stuff, and drove from North Carolina to Donner Pass, California. And went and stayed in a friend's basement, stayed in Jason Hale's basement, and uh, basically lived 10 minutes from the ski resort and took the kids skiing every day. And it was freaking amazing. I mean, Chelsea and I got 20 days. The kids got 18 days. The last 10 days we were there, we got nine feet of snow. I think I sent you guys some pictures. Um, that's so sweet. I'm so, so glad you guys scored, man. I feel like you're always just like California. That's such a dice roll. I'm super stoked. You guys got it good. Yeah, it worked out great for us because the first like two and a half weeks, it was 55 degrees, sunny, and it was perfect just to teach teach the kids what's up. Like Jack's the oldest. He could ski, but the other, the twins couldn't. And dude, by the end of it, I mean, it's amazing and I think you mentioned this when we were on the phone. Well, like skiing is like the first fun thing you can do with your kids. Like, right. Where you're... I remember like my four year old, when my kids turned four, like we could actually go skiing. Yeah. And you know, they're getting on the lift by themselves, off the lift by themselves, you know, and by the end of it, we're on black diamonds and three feet of powder. And you know, they're like taking face shots. <laughs> it was sick. It was like super sick. And then uh, basically got home, and I think everybody was mad at me. <laughs> everybody was basically like, what the hell? Where have you been? So That's where you operate your best when people are angry with you. <laughs> what do you mean by that? You, I, you, heard, you brought that up the other day, and I'm trying, mm -hmm. to, I'm trying to figure out what you mean by that. There's some I just think when, when, you're an, like when you're being antagonized, that's when you really come into your own. <laughs> and I think you angle yourself to, to be in those situations. <laughs> It's just a casual observation. Having worked, having known and worked with you for a, a shoot a couple decades, right? A long time, longer than I'd like to admit. Mm. One day we're going to do an LVM. What's a hot seat? <laughs> oh God, that's going to be epic. I think there's a bit of an autopsy to occur there. <laughs> uh, well, we'll keep that one in our pocket. That'll be a good one, for yeah. sure. That would be a good one. Well, yeah, what do you there's... what? Mm. What have you been doing, man? You were you were going kayaking regularly there for a minute, and I, I haven't seen you in like a month. Uh, well, we went skiing for a wee bit. I, I don't get the five week type. Oh my god, here we go. Vacations <laughs> that Grace can afford, but we did go to uh, Grand Targhee for for a week, which was nice. And then it's as you approach March, we just have been, especially now the way the sports going, we've been insanely busy, but. I did. I have now officially paddled the Little White more than any other river in the Pacific Northwest. <laughs> How many runs do you got? Uh, I don't know. Four. Maybe eight. 
<laughs> Can you guys hear that chainsaw? No. Yes. Ugh, my neighbor is cutting a tree down right now. I should let him know that the hammer fighter is going on. So what happened? Why did you quit paddling? You went on a ski trip? Yeah, and then, and then uh, I just been it's just been really, really, really busy. I know it's a cliche, but there is a lot going on right now. You're in the kayaking biz. So are you dialing it in out there on the little white? Like, how is it? I mean, are you still kind of figuring your way down? Where are you at in the in the process? You know, the problem is this is my. It's hard to communicate this to. I don't know. It's it just you get to my stage in the game. My stage of the game. I'm not going to blame age, but it's just I have not paddled as much as I I have been in the past. You just have you, there's no plan B, right? You go out there and either it's plan A or it's going to be something disastrous is going to occur, <laughs> you know. And it's just not the range of where I want to be. And so you say to yourself, well, if I just could paddle six days a week, that would take care of it. But that's not really realistic, you know. And so you kind of get stuck in this, I don't know, situation. I'm not sure what to make of it. It's just hard to get like the back-to-back days to where you, the, that thought leaves your head. You know what I'm saying? Sure. Like, like when I was even, time. even when I was 40 something, you know, I, I had, I was still paddling enough and I had enough momentum going where like if, if things really turned bad or whatever, you know, I just felt like I, I could always have something. I had a few tricks up my sleeve to pull, you know, to, uh, to keep things moving along. And I, you know, it's not like, I mean, I'm not worried about drowning or anything. I'm just want to have, I just want to be, I just want to feel like I used to paddle. You know what I mean? That's what I want. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's very elusive right now. Mm. So what, what's the flow been out there? Uh, it's been good. I mean, I've paddled more this year cause there's more, it seems to be Lewis can correct me, but it seems to be a lot more water now than there has been. So we moved out here. Yeah. We've had like, we've had a nice winter. We haven't had a ton of high water, but it's been like consistently solid medium plus it's like high threes right now. Perfect. That's perfect. Yeah, it's pleasant. <laughs> what have you been up to, Lewis? <laughs> oh, just working and kayaking and the usual. I don't know. I'm dull. My mom just moved to White Salmon. That's exciting. Whoa. Lewis, you have, this is not professional, but you have a tendril of snot hanging up. There you go. Thanks, John. <laughs> it's really distracting. <laughs> I was just looking at that and not really looking at anything else. It looks like the plants turned the corner back there. It's on the up and up. <laughs> I knew you were going to mention that. I was like, ah, I should take a plant out to the porch before we do the podcast. Uh. Oh, speaking of work, Lewis, what's going on? Is Last time we spoke, we were talking about Deb Holland, new interior secretary. Is she... Well, just kind of fill us in. What's going on? Yeah, I can't remember the last time we did this, but... I think I think her name just came to the top of the list, if I remember right. Yeah, so she was nominated. She had her confirmation hearings last week, um, which seemed to have been, you know, a bit contentious. Like she's, you know, obviously been a hard out environmental advocate, and you know that doesn't fire up a lot of uh, Senate Republicans. So. I don't know. I think the, the hearings were pretty contentious. Like Steve Daines from Montana, fairly disappointingly, has been, uh, you know, leading the charge and opposing her nomination. John Barrasso, who's the top Republican on the Energy and Natural Resources Committee now, is Republican from Wyoming, has also been pretty, you know, outspoken against her. But the uh, committee just voted on her nomination this morning. Um, all the Democrats voted in favor including Joe Manchin, who is a little bit of a question mark, um, as well as Lisa Murkowski from Alaska, and all the rest of the Republicans voted against her, but it looks like she has the votes to get confirmed, which is awesome. Um, super excited. It'll be, uh, it'll be good. Does that mean Harris I'm has so... to come in there and cast the tiebreaker? Maybe not. I don't know. I mean, it's not, I mean, if she has, I guess Susan Collins said today that she was going to vote for, for her confirmation as well, so it sounds like she'll have at least a, you know, a couple of Republican votes. So I'm surprised good. Manchin is on board. Yeah, I reckon that was a not the easiest vote for him. Um, what gives? Uh, I mean, you know, I don't know. I, I, there's a lot of things that Joe Manchin says and does that I don't really fully understand, but I do think that he's a better guy than people give him credit for. Like Manchin's from West Virginia. Yeah, Manchin's, I mean, 
Yeah. You know, by reputation, the most conservative member of the you know Democratic caucus in the Senate, which yeah, makes I mean, him, in a, in which makes him in a position, I mean, which makes Democrat him in a tie, you know, in a 50 50 Senate that makes him, you know, the most important person in the Senate. Oh, he's really, got some power because, right now. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, some of that, I'm sure that he, uh, you know, that puts him in a tough space on something like, you know, Deb Holland's confirmation where it's like, it's, you know, that's a hard vote for him to come out and say, you know, I'm going to support, I'm going to support her given that she's, you know, pretty, uh, you know, pretty serious about, you know, taking on climate change and, you know, transitioning to renewable energy. And like, I'm sure that there are a lot of people in West Virginia who hear that as something threatening. So I think that was a, I don't know, a moment of leadership for him for sure. Hmm. Interesting. Does he have a contested seat or is he in there for a while? And when's his neck, when's he due up for a reelection? That is a good question. I can't remember. I want to say he's up in four years, but it might be two. I think four, though. Hmm. But yeah, I mean, he's the Democrat in the state that Trump won by, what, 30 points or something? So. Mm-hmm. Right. right. Man. Um, it, yeah, I guess the other thing I was going to say is just I'm pretty fired up about this uh, this climate executive order from president biden right out of the gates i mean this was a there's a lot in there that's you know a really big deal in terms of like taking climate change seriously but seriously the executive order was you just get batted back and forth with every new president right well i mean in a sense right i mean it's not a law but i mean he's setting up you know a uh uh this sort of government-wide approach to taking on climate change creating a white house office of domestic climate policy which is something new i mean but but seriously trump takes office again in march 20th i guess is now the new day i thought it was i thought it was today no 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 today was a false it was today was a trap as it turns out it's the 20th so in the 20th i mean all the stuff's going to get reversed well you don't think that that trump's actually the president now really well i think uh you have to take a deep dive into the into (laughs) you have to do the research to really understand this but uh, listen no I've, i've read all the memes and we're talking about serious business here. You hear me? <laughs> have, you, have you guys got your vaccine yet? What do I look how, like? how do I do that? How did you guys get behind me in the line for vaccines? You got vaccinated? Yeah, dude. All you have to do in North Carolina is just is be a, a smoker. Put like, a, like put like a bald like a bald wig on and then put like reading glasses and no. a cane for ten years. All, all you have to do is say you're a smoker. So I just went down there and said I'm a smoker. You did? Yeah. <laughs> After all that. <laughs> I just wanted to get mine before you guys. I really what well, I really didn't are care you, one way or the other. But are you kidding that you got the vaccine by saying you're a smoker? No, I'm not kidding. You can. Uh, it's part of the oh, governor's Grace, order. Hold on for a second. Hold on for a second, Grace. Yeah, let me explain this to you. Grace <laughs> went from someone who enraged literally every listener that ever I I heard I, I heard this from more listeners and more friends about great how how enraged they were Grace's policy on vaccine. So this you was, went from that was, position. This was all a part of Grace's plot to get to the front of the line, to was to discredit jumping, the vaccine among the whitewater jumping, community in Asheville. So you over wouldn't have to, to wait in other line. Exact, <laughs> like an, another. This is what I'm talking about: you thriving in antagonistic situations. This is exactly what I'm talking about: to where you're jumping in line by claiming you're a smoker <laughs> to get the vaccine. Related with the situation, you're, you're thriving. Yeah. Well. <laughs> I've got uh, a little... This delights me on so many levels. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so anyway, got my first jab yesterday. Get the next you one. You look like a smoker. Whenever you know they that? tell you. <laughs> they, did, they didn't question me at all. It's believable. <laughs> I think I was wearing this exact same outfit when I went in there. So anyhow, I was just wondering. Do you realize how much angry an email we're going to get about this? Oh. About jumping in line in front of people who really need to get the shot, like healthcare workers and. Wait, wait, wait! You guys can't have it both ways. <laughs> you can't, <laughs> you can't, in one conversation Dude, diss me for for being I'm like saying, I'm not going to jump right shot. out and what get it. Doing? And now this time you're going to be like, how can you? Do-? 
I don't know where to fit in. I don't fit into any of the any of this. I, I just you guys you ready, convinced me. I saw an opportunity a and I went crucial, for it. A crucial thing to do as a member of society, and everyone needs to wait their turn to make sure that we we uh, we get the the people who need the most taken care of first. That's all you say. <laughs> That's it, dude. You're like the vaccine police, man. <laughs> Let's get off the subject quickly. This, uh, this, this is, is ridiculous. This is going to make things worse for you. The, the longer we do all this. <laughs> oh, my God. Can we talk about the scorch? I'm just kidding. I did not get the vaccine. But you can't get it in North Carolina now if, you're, if you've smoked 100 yeah. cigarettes per month. So you guys can breathe easy. All the listeners out there. Can quit banging on their dashboards. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> when I saw that in the executive order, I could not wait to go on the hammer factor and start talking about it. <laughs> um, do we want to get into these headlines? We got about 10 minutes before we're bringing Benny on, or do we want to jump into the scorch? It's up to you guys. I can do either. The headlines are not that great. I would like to talk about that outside magazine headline. At some point. You mean the but, listener mail? Is that what we're talking about? No, I'm talking about you know, when I put in the show notes here a couple uh, of things that uh, came across the news items. Um, <laughs> let's talk about the Scorch. Five minutes. All right, so I know nothing about the Scorch. Fill me in as fill me in completely. I mean, I know that it's well. Just tell me what you know about it. I mean, Gavin, you probably know the pedigree of this boat better than I do. I'm assuming this is resp- this is sort of Piranha's response to a creek boat, right? I mean, the the Waka type. I mean, I some, this, is, some this is the boat Dave wanted, and what Dave wanted was a ten foot. Dave Fuselli. Yeah, and I, mean, I think what he wanted was a ten foot boat, and Piranha was like, "Okay, we'll do that, but we're also going to do a run of shorter ones as well, or like a line of shorter ones as well." Mm-hmm. So there's going to be a small, medium, large in the you know sort of standard creek boat size range, and then the Scorch X is the ten footer. Um. And that boat that you and I paddled was the prototype for the large Scorch. Right. Not um, the X. Not the X. Okay. No, so but... I'm like, I'm pretty excited to try the X. And like I, the, the large was, was intriguing in a lot of ways. Um, but yeah, I'm, I guess the, the, the X is what fires me up the most. Did you, I mean, I, you now you guys have both paddled it, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, let's hear, let's hear what you, what you thought. Um, it was to, you know, it was a prototype that I was battling. So the construction was like, it was welded together and it was leaking like horrendously when I battled it. So I could only get about a minute at a time in it before it was kind of unpleasant to paddle. So I feel like I didn't, wasn't able to form the most full conclusions, but it was interesting. It has like a ton of bow rocker, like mm-hmm. more bow rocker than any boat probably ever made um and like pretty low stern rocker so the bow stays super dry but it comes out very flat and fast um easy Uh. to paddle the stern was like doing some kind of weird things for me and i don't know how much of that was just not being used to it and how much of it was i don't know some design attributes that we talked about and that they i think changed for the final version so I don't know. It's interesting. It's like it's a it's a cool boat. Definitely worth trying. Weld. Yeah, I mean, I would say first of all, it's going to be a popular boat. Like I know it's going to do well for them, um, just based on the reaction of how many good people around here paddle the boat and really were enthusiastic about it. Uh, in terms of it being like a like an OG replacement, it's not that. I mean, it's a foot longer for one thing, and in my opinion, it paddled like a long boat. At least the prototype I paddled, it just felt like closer, you know, to like a, you know, a green boat than it did an OG in terms of its length. Really? It did have Even a huge with all that bow rocker? rocker? I mean, it felt like you were looking over the cockpit of an airplane in that boat. I mean, the bow rocker was so high. I wouldn't uh, say that. I wouldn't say it felt like a long boat. I just felt I mean, like it felt really fast. I felt like it did feel fast, but it wasn't hard to paddle. I didn't think. Like I could. I. It was enough for me that I was like, if I'm going to be like fumbling around and getting busy, I'd much rather be in an og than in that boat but, but if see, i knew the river well like, I, if i knew the river well i'd want to be in the scorch I mean, like if i was paddling up yak every day it'd be scorch hands down over an og hands down or the blackwater for that matter 
Yeah, and I mean, that's what the OG does for you in a way, right? Like, it makes every other boat feel like it's hard to paddle and hard to turn. Well, the OG is perfected that boof skip to, like, an art form. You know, it's, that is their, that's the, the ace in the hole for that boat. And that, that happens to work perfectly on rivers like the Little White, you know? So, but, yeah, it's... I thought the Scorch was cool. And, like, I, I've never paddled a boat that felt like it would be so easy to go fast on the little white end. Like that is the little white race boat for sure. Yeah, that's right. And that was the large. That mm-hmm. was the large. And how did the sizing it felt feel? Big. It felt big to me. I mean, to me, I, I don't know. But you're what? If I weigh five pounds less, I'd want a medium. I weigh 180. 180. Hmm. Well, I can't wait to try it. It sounds cool to me. I cannot wait to get a piece of the X. That sounds... I'm like I'm super curious, like, you know, like a 10 foot boat. I don't know. I mean, for the green race or something, I mean, I guess, I don't know. I, I guess I feel like for a lot of paddlers on certain white water, you know, paddling like the longest, hardest to paddle, fastest boat is not going to help you. Right. Like it's like, I don't know. I, I guess I just feel like a 10 foot boat. I'm, I'm super interested. I mean, we haven't had a 10 foot boat in 20 years. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, it's refreshing, I know I've mentioned this before, but to see designs coming out that don't have a fictitious barrier of 8 feet 6 inches or 9 feet or something, you know. I think totally. whether this boat is the one or whatever, I think that there will be, I think it'll be a good thing as far as design evolution. Totally. <clears throat> Man, I didn't even know there was a 10-footer came that was coming out until I talked to you guys. Hmm. Um... <clears throat> All right, we have some other items, but I say we get right into Benny. I told him that we'd be calling him right around this time. Um, let's do one news item while I bring him on here. Which of these news items would you want to talk about? American Whitewater and the Tallulah? Um, the Outside Dean Cummings article? Or the Tallest Waterfall out of Ecuador Disappears? If you had to touch on one of those three. Mm. Let's talk about the Dean Cummings article for a minute. Okay, so to summarize this article, so Dean Cummings, he was a pioneer in extreme skiing, big mountain skiing, had some successes, some major successes, went, started a very successful heli operation in Alaska, and for all intents and purposes, just went crazy, is the best I can understand from the article at the age of... 50 something or the other and 52 I think is what it was and and uh shot somebody and killed them in New Mexico and now he's in prison I'll link to this article in the show notes but there were some interesting things that kind of jumped out to me in this article um what were you guys' take on it I mean I guess to me it was like it uh it was sort of it was uncomfortable to read. I mean, it's like a super super sad story, but it also felt like 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 it was giving this like you know just tragic story, this like uh, sort of like cinematic treatment or something like meant for you know you to gawk at or something in a way that made me kind of uncomfortable. But I mean, you know, a big part of the story was that I mean, it seemed like you know there were a lot of people in his life who you know, knew that he was very unwell and wanted to get him help and were not able to do that. And, you know, I guess I've heard some similar stories from friends who's, you know, have had family members who have had, you know, really bad sort of like mental breaks like this. And, you know, it's like, obviously in society, we value people's autonomy and their ability to make their own decisions about medical treatments and things like that. But it feels like, in a lot of ways, this is an example that we've gone too far. You know, it's like there are people who need to be, there needs to be some ability to have like a forcible health intervention, you know, like where you're not really doing somebody like Dean Cummings like a favor by letting him continue to, you know, drift about in the world, destroying everything in his life and ultimately killing somebody, you know? And it's like, it's like, 
society is only set up to intervene when somebody like runs afoul of the law and there's no ability to like intervene and be like you've lost your mind like you're going to the hospital you know no fully i hear you on that one i don't know it's that's such a it's we, very hard right yeah. it's very hard but to put your finger on it. things that kind of stood out to me in this is that i have known a few people in the extreme sports world whitewater and other sports who have not to this level gone off their rocker but in my opinion have kind of gone off their rocker and in the article it talks about uh three you know three things was it was it uh, a condition of just so many years of being in these extreme environments and doing these extreme things is it a a lifetime it's mentioned in the article that it was you know he had been a, a weed smoker for long long periods of time and it mentioned in the article that he had bumped his head and had several concussions you know it's like but i not to that degree and i don't want anybody to think that i think someone is getting ready to go crazy and shoot somebody but i know several people that have got to this age and it seems like it's you know weld says he's seen these kind of things happen earlier in their 20s but like i feel like i've seen more of these kind like of like people go schizophrenic in their late teens that's typically when people go schizophrenic you know that's the only thing that stood out to me yeah i just wonder i just wonder if there's a you know is it a magic combination of all of that kind of stuff that extreme athletes have like you know a tendency to drop off the other side you know and it's like i do think you know like you they talk about his you know kind of like his youth and like i feel like in a lot of ways like sports like ours attract that personality type right like people who are really you know looking for that uh i don't know that freedom and risk taking and adrenaline or whatever it's like you know i don't think it's coincidental that you know a lot of people who maybe have some of the sort of like underlying things that lead to this like find their way into our sports you know i don't know if there's any i don't know if there's any story to be had there the whole thing felt clickbaity to me when we, <sighs> back in the day we did a, we did we did an expedition somewhere or another and uh we had a ton of sponsors and outside contacted us about covering a trip and we were all excited about it because that's you know it's good for the sponsors and so they did a one of the before we left they did one of those little blurbs at the beginning i forgot what they're called like short stories or you know news things at the beginning of the magazine and we asked the guy if they could do a, a feature or some kind of bigger story when we get back and he's like no not unless someone dies if someone dies let us know <laughs> that's how that's how he left it that <laughs> article was, that line, the, it, it, was, it was it was an interesting <laughs> article interesting story but you're right the way it was written was so uh over the top dramatic it was. It was like they were setting it up for a short film or something. I don't know. Well, they have to compete with you guys... a bunch of a bunch of true crime podcasts now. Yeah, that was what it was <laughs> like, right? Yeah. Did you see? Yeah. Outside just got acquired. Did you guys see that? <laughs> By who? Like Gimlet? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> if I was a company like North Face or Patagonia or something, and I wanted to expand, I'd buy a publication like Outside. Huh. I, I really? Mm-hmm. I would. I, mean, I have friends. I have friends in the paddle sports print media. You know, like like Scott at Rapid, and obviously Tune at Kayak Session. And I mean, I have tremendous respect for those guys. They've been in this game a long time, but I, I mean, this day and age, I don't envy that medium. Yeah. Oh God, I could go all day about that. Go ahead. Ah, we don't have time. We're getting back. We're getting into the most beautiful man in Whitewater right here. Um, all right, I'm going to see if I can get him connected. Um, Lewis, can you do a little introduction for us while I, while I get this? <laughs> you going? just fawn over Benny. Yeah, Benny I just need a little. <laughs> That's exactly what I was. Doing. Yeah, I can. I can fawn about Benny for a minute. <laughs> I don't know. How do you introduce Benny? Everybody knows Benny. He's. I don't know, man. Whitewater Zen master. This beautiful man in white water. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see if I can get him in here. I'm calling. All 
I will say that, and I can't wait to get into this story with Benny. If you say, uh, we're talking, we're just, we're talking about you, Benny. Just give us a second. Yeah. <laughs> He came. He came into. He came into IR. Uh, you know, IR is a bit of a salon, if you will. There's sort of an <laughs> ongoing cast of characters that come wandering through the White Salmon Institution, and usually it's kind of the usual bro bra chit chat. But Benny sat down, and we had like a, I'd say like an hour long, very, very in depth, complicated conversation about the nature of whitewater and paddling, and a lot of philosophical aspects to it which i think we need to talk about at some point in this conversation because i think that reflects on some aspect of his paddling that that i i want to get some clarification on right hi <laughs> okay go ahead welcome to the hammer factor ben mar um yeah so let's just get right into the philosophy of whitewater <laughs> there's no reason to beat around the bush here it's <laughs> good so where are you? It. I'm in Victoria, BC. Okay. All right. Yeah. I quarantined here. Are you, are you st still? You're still quarantining? No, no. But I'm. This is the place where I executed my 14 day cleansing. <laughs> <laughs> do you feel? Where were you that you needed to do this? Pardon? Where were you that you needed to do this? Or what were you doing that required this? I was in Zambia. Ah. Um, but yeah, if you're out, <clears throat> if you're out of Canada, when you come back in, unless you are approved at the border for having been on essential reasons to mm. leave, then you just have to do the 14 day. I think running the shit is essential though. Me too. <laughs> so I told the guy, he said it wasn't. Gelman, <laughs> did you read the most recent New Yorker? I feel like this is appropriate with Benny here. The most recent New Yorker that had the article about the the astonishingly low covid death rates in developing countries i have not fascinating like if I, you look at I africa read it. I read india it. the percentage of deaths are far far less than the developed world particularly us and britain places like that and they really have no exact reason why go figure zambia could have been the safest place to be right now it was. It was the greatest place to be. I just yeah. think if you're in Zambia, there's probably other things that are a little more worrisome than the old coronavirus. Well, underreporting is probably part of the picture, for sure. Yeah. <clears throat> well, we could go into the particulars of that. Like You could probably talk about obesity, propensity to smoking, all sorts of other things. That, But that's a different show for right now. Yes, that's correct. Now, Benny, I put a little post out saying we we're going to have you on, and there were a lot of good questions that came in from the Hammer Factor audience, but a few of these I just want to jump into real quick here before we get into a little bit uh, deeper dive on some various things. And, you know, these are things that everybody needs to know. First thing, Brian Penninger, paddle length and offset. Uh, 201 and... 65, 55, and 45. Woo. All right. Interesting. Straight shaft, mid shaft. By the end of the Zambezi trip, I was at 200 um, because my arms were sore. Okay. And do you dial back the the uh, the angle there, or does the um, feather stay the same? I was playing with it at the end because I just felt I was sensitive, so I thought it was, it was a good time to tweak things around because – you just we were paddling so much and I, I was getting just i needed a break and i was with dane and dane uses a 30 degree for everything and his reasoning is that um when he needs to stick stick a blade in the water he doesn't want to mess around with the angle. he just needs a blade in the water so he thinks as you get above a 30 degree angle you waste time in getting the blade into the water um, but I don't, I don't really know. <clears throat> gotcha. From right stroke to left stroke. There's, he just, he wants his, like all of his reactive strokes to be as quick as possible. Hmm. <clears throat> 201, 45, 55, 65. I like that. Kyle Hall. He says, why is your calendar all GoPro shots? I feel like you need to step it up. <laughs> Um, well, the first calendar was 
maybe one or two GoPro shots and all the shots I used, I asked for my friends photos for permission and I didn't give them any money or anything. I, that was gifts of usage from them. And on the next one, starting in Ecuador, I just paid extra attention to the light in my surroundings each month when I was kayaking. And I thought, Oh, I'm just going to see if I can pull one off with all of my own photos. And and I did, and I like all the photos, Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> and now, I, and now I have a camera. I have a, I got a, a Fuji X-T4, same camera that the great Eric Boomer uses. And so now I have, I've got photos of other people. So maybe the next calendar will just have no photos of me and other people only and be just a different thing to look at. Trevor Spick, he wants to know, why aren't there any nudes? Well, there was quite a bit of feedback about the nudity, <laughs> especially during the month when people flipped the calendar to that photo. And from uh, there was positive and negative feedback from all genders. So uh, I think the next calendar will have some more nudity in it. <laughs> of you or others? Pardon? Of you or others? Of me. Oh. <laughs> well, moving on. Um, <laughs> Matthew Wilkinson, he wants to know, he, he's thinking about growing his hair out. Any tips? Hmm. Stop cutting it. It's okay. Very well said. Uh, Ian Van Stoutmeister, he wants to see your tax returns. Any chance we can get a look at that? Is he an accountant? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, sorts. <laughs> you can definitely help me. Oh, <laughs> uh, and then uh, lastly, before we get into some other stuff here um, from the Peanut Factory, Michael Bone he wants to know about yoga pants. Uh, is that a question or a? It's the. I, I just if think you to wear a pant and do yoga. You could call that pant a yoga pant. <laughs> Is there a preferred material or style um, for your yoga practice? Uh, whatever shorts I have close by, I use. I just use shorts. Um, sometimes when I do yoga, it's very early in the morning and cold, and then I'll put on pants, loose fitting. Sometimes I feel, like I feel like we're wasting this interview. Can we talk about <laughs> something, something comfortable. <laughs> let's talk about let's talk about Dane Jackson real quick. Is Dane the best whitewater kayaker in the world right now? Uh, in my opinion, that's that's definitely a what I would call him. Yeah, I mean, compare and contrast your approach to paddling hard white water and his approach. Like, are you guys different. I mean, you have some fundamental differences in that in that regard, or is it kind of all turned into the same thing at some point? Um, well, so he, I was just with him for two months, and <clears throat> the way that we're different, I don't think. I mean, he's he's just such an animal, and he he doesn't make mistakes very often, and he makes decisions really quickly, whether that's to not do something or to do it. Um, he and you're talking about like in the context of like looking at a rapid yeah I, I i would call him the best because in any discipline he has ex like excelled far past what you would have called the best previous to him um but that doesn't mean to me that he's my absolute favorite to watch you know i watch people for different reasons but mm -hmm. if you're on the banks of the river Mm -hmm. You're watching what he's doing because you something's going to happen, um, typically, not always. And he he just has a boat control that's pretty much unmatched. But that that also just comes from his history. Like I I just don't think anyone's got the time in a boat. You could be twice his age. I don't think you have the same amount of time in a boat as him. Mm -hmm. um, and then our differences are like when I run something, I'm completely. I'm going in, not all the time, but I've accepted that it might not go the way I want it to. And he doesn't seem to accept that. 
uh, I don't think he he does anything that he he thinks he's taking much of a risk with his technique and placement. And there's a rapid <clears throat> on the lower Zambezi called there's upper Moemba and lower Moemba. And lower Moemba has it's like a river wide waterfall, but the whole river right the water turns against this rock. So say you were actually running the waterfall, you would be looking at river right. And it's not even that far in front of you, maybe 10 feet. And it's dangerous, weird. And I've run it many times at low water, but we went down there this year at high water and we were, we were looking at it and it was just this crazy ledge booth. And maybe you could go over to river right and scout it and run it and it would be like a pretty safe line but it was that's a long day it's like 53 kilometers we were into at that point and <laughs> it's hot we were tired so i didn't i didn't care enough to go over there and i was looking at the line i was like ah, i don't know and dame looked at it pretty quickly and he went and ran it and he did he did say he made mistakes in his approach uh but you can't really tell from the video he really stomps this absolutely horrific ledge booth um and i looked at it and i thought should i shouldn't i and i've just i've come to a point now where it's a lot easier for me to walk things than uh, it used to be especially with big water and besides our age difference um i mean how how, how much different are you guys in age six years that's not a whole lot i, I a lot can happen in six years age. I mean, when do you feel like, I mean, you, you mentioned you started looking at rapids and started to decide to carry them. Was there a, a moment in time where that's suddenly just something switched in your head and you're like, well, I can walk this. And it's just not that big of a deal. Uh, it's more like ego. When I was on the Baker, I, uh, there's a rapid it's just called the Portage or the Portage. And we were looking at it. I was with Tyler Brott and Sven Lomler and Sven had run it higher and lower, but we were all walking it. And I was tormenting myself in my head because I didn't want to run it. Um, and I didn't see a line. But the water, you know, the water's going through. And uh, I thought, oh, fuck, like, like maybe I'm just not running. Maybe this is the beginning of the end of me running big water, white, big water rapids that have been run. Mm -hmm. And then we got back. We went, so, I don't know what happened. We went. Uh, you mean you'd have different motivation if the rap, the rapid had not been run? Mm, like you'd be more inclined to run it. Yeah, I'd want to run it if it hadn't been run, but it was more, I couldn't, I knew I didn't want to run it. And I was like, why don't I want to run it? This is, these are the things that I uh, think I want to do, or I think I should want to do. Mm -hmm. And one day we got there and I looked at it and it, it was very, it was, lower water level and I thought oh yeah I'm running this <clears throat> so I'd gone through this little shift and then I ran it and I swam and that kind of sucked Aniel just posted about he just posted a cool video of him running it um, and same on that same trip on the FUDA I was running the FUDA one day on my own and I was coming up to Zeta and and I was just talking to myself in my head and I was like this is the one that's kind of risky should I just walk it? I was like, there's no one here. It's just me and you, the voice in my head. <laughs> like, <laughs> why are we thinking about running this versus not running it? Like, what's the point in running it? But then also, what's the point in not running it? And together, we decided that it's because we <laughs> run shit like this and I ran it. <laughs> so you both agreed it was a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> Before we get too far into this interview, tell us about your roots in the sport. Were you, your parents paddle? How did you get into it? How old were you? Obviously, I believe you were an Ottawa kid early on. Give us a little detail on that. Uh, carrying on from my dad's side, <clears throat> they they did canoe trips in Algonquin Park, flatwater canoe trips. And there is a little bit of whitewater in the park. So the first time I went into the park, I was two. Um, and that was a common summer trip as a family. And I think when I was 
seven, we started interacting, or that's what, when I think I started interacting with whitewater. Uh, so it was whitewater canoeing, and my dad and I would uh, take whitewater canoe lessons together, and he would also take solo whitewater canoe lessons uh, through, I think, a variety of places, but including Madawaska Canoe Center, which is uh, like Katrina and Van Wick's family business that her sister now runs, Steffi. Um, and I sat in a kayak when I was nine, I think, and I liked it. I probably ran a little bit of moving whitewater around then. And then I think I was on the Ottawa by the time I was 11. And I had a, a dancer, a perception dancer, and I had that boat for probably four years. Um, and then the Ottawa River was just, that was the river I went to after that. So we wouldn't, the Madawaska River is a tributary, so we'd probably still go there sometimes, but the Ottawa became the main event. Um, weekend trips, I got left there eventually when I was um, 13, turning 14 that summer. Uh, I stayed on a this place we used to call it the island, and that's where the island boys lived, and that's Dale Monkman, Hal Monkman, Bruce Monkman, Patrick Camblin, Marlo Long, and some of the the older YGP movies feature the island and the Ottawa River. And it's that's when it started to become more obsessive, like through high school. And Chris Grotman's was a big paddling buddy of mine. He his family's they're like dual citizens, so not too far from the Ottawa, they've got a house like a, they call it the cottage. But they would be up there every summer, and he used to pick me up. Uh, drive out of, his, out of his way and pick me up and bring me to the Ottawa and let me use one of his kayaks. Uh, and that's it. Like I, I went through high school. I did one year of college very close to the Ottawa River. And in that year, Chris emailed us. So I would have been just turned 18. And Chris emailed myself and Kelsey Thompson and Dave Newenhouse and said we should go to the Nile. And that's what we did. I, I stopped going to college and I got a job and saved up money and went to the Nile the next year. Parents excited about that choice? <laughs> Pardon? Were your parents yeah. excited about that choice? Yeah. Yeah. I told my mom I thought it would be better to save up a similar amount of money that it would cost me to go to school for a year and spend it on this trip. And she agreed. <laughs> Sick. Yeah. How old were you? Do you remember... God, I don't know what year this was, but it was the first time I ever met you. It was on the green. Do you remember that trip coming down here? How old were you when that happened? Um, so I was with Max Neuwasser. So yep. Max Neuwasser, Chris Grotmans, and I all met. I'd met Max before on the Ottawa. Uh, he was taking a course with Joey Hitchens. And I think Chris was always the best out of us. And... Max was learning quickly, like crazy fast. I'd kayaked longer than Max. But we ended up taking a course together called Junior Development Pro Pro Program, JDP. And it was two weeks. So then Max and I drove down there, I guess, to paddle. And I'll never forget that day, Grace, because when you pee on your brains out on sunshine in front of John Grace, <laughs> mm -hmm. nice. you don't forget. <laughs> 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 Dude, you, sh you shook it off like a champ, man. Well, yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know. It would have been high school. It would have been my second trip down there because Chris, I used to work at a rafting company and um, at River Running, Chris was there. He, he just said, man, it's raining heaps at home. I'm driving home and you should come. And it was, I'd creek boat, I'd, gone creek boating once on another tributary to the Ottawa with him and Spencer Cook and it was just this one little waterfall we ran and then we were driving to the southeast and Chris was telling me all about the talks way and I had no clue what the talks away was until he kept describing it I was like oh my gosh Chris is this like what I've seen in LVM that one with the crazy <laughs> flies and that that's the first creek I ever ran from from top to bottom the talks uh, way yeah. That's, <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> it's and, a fine introduction to Creek Boat. <laughs> it was, and, and yeah, I just credit Chris for just constantly telling me 
It's like it doesn't matter that you haven't been in a creek boat too too much because all the things you need you you've learned long ago on the Ottawa. What's the it was boater talk I think because he made a video about it and he got into boater talk conversations about it. <laughs> being irresponsible but uh, that was my first trip then that trip with max was the second one so and i bet it was 17 i bet it was 16 or 17 and then fast forward what year did you run size ed um 2012 2012 and how old were you then 25 25 wow a lot happened in a few years that yeah, was you got to site when you got to Site Z that day, did you uh, did you have an inclination you were going to run it? I mean, was that you were gearing up for that, or just a decision you made on the fly right there? Mm, that would like how we were talking about seeing that Lower Moemba or the Portage on the Baker. When I'm looking at something and thinking like this is part of like me to run stuff, <clears throat> it probably started at Site Z where. Um, I didn't have no. I didn't. I wasn't going there expecting to run it. I hadn't even heard of it. Like I didn't have a grasp of the river in my head. I didn't have a map. And I'd met Doug Ammons just before at, at Boomer's house in McCall, and he's the one who said that there's a rapid in there that no one's ever run before. He said it's got about it's got four really massive features, and it's it's definitely possible, but no one's done it. So that's the first I'd heard of it. So it was on my mind the whole time but because I'd never had seen the river or felt it outside of um, outside of you know media from like LVM and uh, one of Russia's movies which one was that um, and then and then the stories of course and the stories about the Sakin are pretty dark and gloomy and rainy like they're very intense stories so I just kind of went in and felt it out and it's such a good river. It's really classic white water. So by the time we got there, um, I was, I just, I just looked at it with just open mind and open eyes and saw that, yeah, the water doesn't never really gets held up anywhere. So I was with Evan, we were, and we used to, we used to portage so high. It was just, that's what people would do. They get up high. Um, so we got, we were portaging up and up and up and Evan put his boat down. He said, man, it's not that bad. And I put my boat down and looked at it. I just left my boat there and spent the rest of the day scouting. And again, like the voice in my head is just ridiculous. <laughs> I was going to cue that up. How was that conversation? God, it was wild. <laughs> I, was so, um, I was so concerned about um, what everybody else thought. Like, I've always been like that, um, like insecure or just like not super high outward self confidence. It's so, like thinking that because it's been carried so much, you must have this wrong. I, some of it was, you know, I thought like who's been here and why didn't they run it and what, what else could have been going on? Like, you know, a lot of it is weather, um, air temperature, time of year. We were there in, august so it was warm out mm -hmm. and that that was there hadn't i don't think there'd been that many trips through there that early in the summer or i guess that's kind of late summer um but it's early stikin season for sure super early stikin season and i my my i was worried that i was like what if do they think i'm scouting this just so that <laughs> they think i'm considering it like, and, I, and I have to keep shutting myself up and be like, stop it. Like, look at the holes. Like, look at the holes. Can you get through? And I just kept going up and down. Um, and, then, and then I think the next morning I just spent a lot of time looking at the bottom feature. I mean, that night, are you nervous or you just put it out of your mind? Uh, I, I just, I wasn't nervous. I was just thinking about it. And it was a lot of wonder. I was like, I wonder, like, I wonder what I'm going to feel like. And I, I didn't. I hadn't settled into a feeling yet. I was just wondering what it would be like. So in the morning I ate, I tried to move quickly and I, I just went back to scouting and walked around and everyone was super cool with waiting um, while I made up my mind. Would it be safe to say that you kind of had made your mind up? You were just trying to let that be acceptable. 
I think that's what happens now and in the past, like five years where you make up your mind and I don't like attack, like if I've made up, you make up your mind pretty quickly and you don't latch onto it. And then you're just like putting all the pieces in place that is different for every, everybody, what you need to see and what you need to feel before you go. But I, I think in the morning I, I was constantly doubting it. I was like, why, like, why didn't, what am I not seeing? And the very, if you see the, if you see pictures of it now, there's this rock. And even if, if you look at a Sarah Solstice Burroughs production, it's just, it's just Aniel and Jared. And in that they're standing on this rock and you can see the crack in it. And that's now broken apart. But when that rock was, so this, this is probably around when the same year they did the Adidas sick line thing, which is probably 2013. Cause that's when Jared ran it and you can see the crack in the rock and that rock broke and the line changed. So what I was most worried about was the reactionary coming off of that rock. I didn't know if I could get my boat up and over it because um, it was so big. Is that the very top feature where you're on the far yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. And now there's that rock's broken. So there's water, there's like pressure going through. Um, and then if you look at, uh, oh, I just blanked his name. That's not good. Um, so it's, it's, you know, the first part that I ran, like you're kind of like on river, right. And you're just kind of changing your boat angle and choosing when to put in speed. So that kind of, that feeling's now extended past that rock where you're just going to go, oh, like, I hope nothing mm -hmm. crazy happens to take my bow. Cause you just need to be pointed there and you, you go past. But I was just really worried that I was going to get to that feature and just get kicked left or back ended. And that would be the start of many seconds of just being like, damn it, like <laughs> plan B. Um, Cause of the whole rapid, I just, I'm always just trying to move right. Basically. Grace, did you ever, how close were you to running that rapid John Grace? On two situations, I really saw the line and, really wanted to run it um i one time i felt a little um a little rushed on it it was uh, we kind of were in a little bit of a rush and the other time um a bunch of people in our group had a really bad experience on the river that day and it was almost like i didn't want to like you're talking about like i kind of wanted it and i kind of saw it but it was like the dynamic of the day it wouldn't have been right. I don't. I don't what was the bad experience? Oh, we just had some swims up river Wasson. and stuff. We had a swim at Wasson's and like, <clears throat> and but but then, you know, I was kind of like, ah, we'll shake this off. Everybody will go to sleep and whatever, and we'll see in the morning. But the river came up like three feet overnight, and it was a totally different place. Um, but you know, that was a that really stood out to me um, as a like a pinnacle achievement in the sport of things that have happened much like when Tyler ran um, Palouse and like just very big things that happened. But what was crazy about that time was this came out, you ran this rapid. I was jaw dropped. You know, I was just like fanboy all the way and whatever. And what made the news of whitewater was the drainage ditch up there that i mean what's the name of it i'm drawing a blank on the name of it. yeah and freaking and that was all over and you like look on social media and there's like 17 million views of this and like there's a video of you running site zen and it's got like 3400 yeah. views and i'm like what is going on you know yeah. i remember being like this is so weird but no that was uh i, I remember just just being in awe and just being like just seeing the transformation and the growth and just like, you know, that's why I wanted to ask that time from when you were on the green all the way up to there, you know, so many, so many things happened in that time. I mean, when you got done with the rapid, were you like, yeah, were you just kind of like, what was your stoke with the rest of the trip? Like, how did you ride it out? Um, the way when I, when I was going through the rapid, my, what I ended up, doing was that I thought if I can get myself in front of that bottom hole anywhere from center left of that hole to anywhere right um, 
It's like if I can make it there, whether I'm upside down, right side up, it's like I know I can deal with the rest of the rapid. Um, no, 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 no. So, I mean, like you're going down through the rest of the river. You got the whole day Chicago. You've got all yeah. of the rest of the stuff. Like how well, I still, there? I still didn't have an idea of like what the rest of the rapids look like because oh, I, okay. I kind of went in like as soon as I saw the river, I just thought, okay, wash away everything that you've thought seen or heard and have your own experience so as we moved through and we got to pass fail and that was sweet and wassons and then scouting sites ed and running that uh you know i just finished running it we all met up and then just started day two and we did run it in three days <clears throat> and as we went through it was it's just good like it's just it's beautiful and it's good white water and we got to the wall and that was one where you know the only, Evan had run the river once before and Mikel had run the river once or twice before and they just they wanted us to run that uh, there were seven of us so they wanted the five of us who hadn't run the river to just have this experience going down the wall and it was the time of day that the sun's coming into your eyes, which is, is just, it was just funny. So we, we just ran this rapid on beta and then you camp, um, you know, you, then you, you run garden of the gods and you're at this iconic camp wolf tracks and same, we're just, I don't know. It was just fun. And, um, in the morning we're getting in and, and Evan was like, I'm not letting you walk anything today. <laughs> and it hadn't, <laughs> I hadn't thought about like, oh, because if I don't, then besides running site Z, then I get to have a complete descent. I hadn't thought of it. Um, so I started, I knew a little bit more about day two because Max had a really awful experience in there with um, Austin Rothman, who like he had had a swim and on his first trip at Wasson's, he and Max went in one year camped the first night the water came up and they decided to run everything out on day two and max's story of he they're just getting flushed one after another into these rapids one of them would catch a an eddy the other would miss it so they they just had to rally down the section so i was trying to think of everything in my head and we got to scissors it had changed it just wasn't that bad like some people got out and started walking and evan and i called everyone back up because it, it was just it wasn't what we thought it would be. And then Hold It Eight Chicago, <clears throat> coming into that, it's one of my favorite little rapids, big rapids. And then Hold It Eight Chicago now is something that's on my mind. If I'm, if it's, you know, if I'm going to be interacting with it that day, it's the one that I'm always like, fuck, like thinking about making sure that I, I approach it with high energy and having just like prepared a bit because it's kind of gnarly. And when we got there, I just, Evan and I scouted it from river left, which is pretty committing to running one of the main lines. You can run left to all the way right, or you can run it down the left, or you can portage a little bit on the right and then kind of run out the outflow. And it was good. Like I just, I did the same thing. I just went down the river like it was another river that I hadn't run before. <clears throat> And a lot of it too, a lot of, there's a lot of excitement for V drive that kind of pulls you through some of those, those bigger rapids towards the bottom. Uh, uh. <laughs> kind of got cold, cold chills thinking about the sticky there. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> it's so thick and no one's been in there. Like last year, uh, there was a request from BC whitewater to just be re really respectful of the wishes of that Northern community. Um, and the northern community was was reaching out and just saying we don't want uh, visitors up here. We really want to protect everybody from uh, COVID exposures. So no one was going up there, but I kept watching the levels, and it was so high you wouldn't have gone up anyway. And so the next lap in there, I think I would expect to see some changes. Like it was up over a thousand Qmex for a long time, and even up over I think eighteen hundred Qmex for a stretch there. Oh, wow. That's going to be super interesting. That yeah, river changes a lot over yeah. all the times I've ran it. It was pretty much different every time. Yeah. Hmm. All right. Let's transition from there into 
that was a big ev evolution, a big jump forward. And then how many years later was it when you and Aniol, I believe two runs in a day, no portages? Is that? And yeah. Tell me how that happened. Were you guys talking about, hey, let's do this? Or how did how did that come to be? Yeah, the the year after I went back and I did two runs, I did not run Site Z and it was it looked the same and I I basically just succumbed to the the thought that I got lucky because I was looking at the same moves and I was like I don't know if I can do that again and then Jared ran it uh, the following year I don't think we were up there and the, it was the year after that that Aniel and I went and we ran it <clears throat> six times over just under two weeks and it would have been on one of those campfires because we we'd, we'd only do two day runs to make sure we were on the river every single day um, in running lots of whitewater each day. And you just, you, you start spending less time on the water and more time at camp, even just doing two days. And we did a couple one days that were taking us under six hours, I think. Um, and it's, it's long days. So we just, I was like, I bet we could do it twice. And the next year Jared came up and that's what we did. We spent a bunch of time running laps and then went for it on a two day. And it was, I wanted to do, I think on our first lap down, we were, we were at site Z, I think before seven in the morning and we ran it, but you can, you can run it and then kind of scoot right. And it's not necessarily comfortable because it's scrapey and still fast, but you're not going to get beasted in that hole. Um, and that year, we'd, we'd also run it quite high that year, almost as high as Aniel's high descent. And as the water came down, like I always wait for the bottom hole to look good to start running Site Z, and the bottom hole never looked good. And I, when I started thinking about it, I was like, oh, it's because you were seeing it. Whereas the other year, I never walked down there to look at it. So it probably always looks bad. <laughs> <laughs> it just always goes. <laughs> To some extent, you know, I've seen Aniel get stuck in there. I've seen Miria get stuck in there. But, yeah, two in a day just seemed like a huge effort, but uh, possible. And we just kind of rode that that possibility. I know that Aniel, I think in the first lap, he had some doubts that he kind of kept to himself to, to mull over and see how it went throughout the day. And by the time... By the time we got to the truck and I was driving up for for the the second one, I I felt I felt then like this this is good like I'm not worried about this. I I reserved uh, you know bandwidth to for like for problems along the way because it's a lot of white water to to run, but I had a really nice settled feeling um, all through that second lap, no matter where we were. I was still on my toes, but I, I just felt like it was, <clears throat> I just had a, a really good sense of security that all three of us were going to finish and, and really enjoy it. What time did you get to the truck on your first run? I can't remember. Um, both, both runs were like between six hours and 15 to 20 minutes. Like there was only about five minutes. I think it was like 618 and 620. Um, That's wild. Yeah, they're super consistent on timing. That's rolling. <laughs> Were you tired? Yeah, but <laughs> that was our eighth and ninth <clears throat> consecutive runs, too. So we were already tired. Like, we were just kind of settled into that that fatigue where you have, you have access to all your strength, um, but it's, I think it's that, that's when it, you start you switch over from like excitement and stoke into like mindset and relying on your body to execute the demands basically huh. i feel like you're like you're like more thoughtful about like what you're thinking and what you're feeling when you're doing these things than like anybody i know and like how much of that is is things that you just like figured out i mean i I know it's like your creativity and like thinking about all of it, but like how much of it is like 
like are there influences that helped like bring you to this like headspace for running the shit you know i think i think because i I used to think of um insecurity and lack of self-confidence as a weakness and then i was able to over time you like accept i accept things about myself and it turns into a strength where I just feel like insecure and now I feel self-aware where it's like, I like how much I think. And <clears throat> a lot of it, cause I, I spend a lot of time in my own head, like rolling things around, but then say I'm paddling with Oniel, like those, those six laps that we did together, we didn't talk huge amounts on the water and we created this dynamic where we didn't have to. And there was times where I felt like I'm just here to make sure that he's okay and he's here to make sure I'm okay as we explore this river and uh, this endurance and this unknown because it's we were we were really like spending a lot more time up there and you know if it if it's statistically you know I'm I'm worried more about driving now than when I was a kid because. I drive a heap. I drive a lot at night. I drive long distances. I've never had a crash. I've been driving since I'm like 14. That's 20 years. So I've got like 20 years of driving without crashing. Like shit. Like I need to like dial up my awareness so I don't mess it up. And like every lap I do down the stakine that works, I'm like, okay, that was good, but don't forget about the numbers game. And watching Anuel, and I don't know what he's thinking about, but I make assumptions about what he's thinking about. And it's always that, like, he's better than me, he's faster than me, he's stronger than me. So that's, like, the carrot that I'm chasing. And then you add Jared into that picture, same thing. And then paddling with the Lomlers. Like, I'm always having self-deprecating thoughts that motivate me to, like, shut up, basically. So that's how I approach a lot of endurance stuff. It's like, I just think like someone else would be able to do it so I can do it. But what, what was your, <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Like, just no, no, like no. where you were, just keep like, going. Where you were going. <laughs> yeah. Like, I don't know. Like when you were talking about, you know, that process of turning, you know, feeling self-conscious into being self-aware, like, you know, there are a lot of people who are self-conscious who don't have the ability to, you know, make that transition. Like, and I guess I'm just, thinking about like i don't know like you're it's like i feel like you've put in a lot of work and thought into arriving at the like mental states that you want to be in on a consistent basis you know like i guess i'm sort of wondering about that journey does that make sense yeah i i really attribute a lot as well to the ottawa river and surfing out of holes and not being able to surf out of holes when i was younger like just the buoyancy that you carry like your weight to the buoyancy of the life jacket and your weight to the buoyancy that's held inside a kayak that's too big for you you just get stuck in these holes and then that comfort coming with you when you're bigger and you have better boat control um so when and it's very specific like like i don't paddle certain types of white water because I'm trying to be around the white water that I like more of, but I'm very uncomfortable in certain types of white water. Uh, like what kind of white water makes you nervous? Um, really steep, really shallow. Like when you're, when you're, when your hull's interacting a lot with rocks, like the talks away. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would be nervous, very nervous, uh, putting on the talks away and there's just a learning curve. That I think would happen fast, but um, like I, I really like the Green River. That is a super fun river. The first time I ran it was with Chris that first trip, and it was 250 percent. And I remember watching him. Well, I remember standing at at uh, the pad, and Chris. We were just talking about the line, and Chris just said, "By the way, you're walking this." And I said, "Oh, okay." <laughs> Thanks. <Anyway. laughs> And, and I walked down and I watched him run it. And it was one of the coolest things I'd 
ever seen someone do in a kayak and it still is a burning memory seeing him turn that corner and put a boof in that was really cool but i like to be i like my boat to be in the water i like my entire paddle blade to be in the water it's what makes me comfortable and happier like the um i just i love that type of white water so i try to interact with it as much as possible but if you put me like if i went to the southeast to paddle i'd be uncomfortable because i would i would feel like i can't paddle it as well as i would like to um and it's a really big there's a lot of people there like the whitewater community there's super big so i would feel like under pressure to be like a good kayaker where in a in an environment where i don't think i'm that good um so you put together a crew of paddlers, right? And on one hand, you have like Dane. And I don't know Dane that well, but I know his dad pretty well. And, you know, EJ does stuff because he's like, I'm right. Of course I'm right. I can do that. Done. That's his, that's that's the decision-making process, you know? Um, and he goes full full in, you know, completely confident that it's going to happen according to plan. And for what you described to Dane, it's kind of the same process. It seems like there's a lot more mental gymnastics going on in your head when you approach a really hard rapid. Um, I mean, when you're putting together a group of paddlers, do you, is there a tension between you and Dave when you guys are paddling together because you're so different in the way you approach stuff? Or is it like you and Annual, it's a, it's a chemistry that works? I, I love paddling with Dane. I, I like watching how he, how he moves around. Um, no, there's no tension. It's very different. I mean, do you envy his ability not to worry about these kind of things? No, like I, I really like... I, I like how I kayak mm -hmm. and there's things I'm, I'm still working on changing. Um, but it, I'm just, I'm trying to make changes and develop my technique to help me kayak better, but still like the way my own body works. Um, I like watching Dane. I like watching that. It's, it's cool. Like I, I can't remember who I've talked to about this, but if you go to an event, you're kind of, I'm kind of just rooting for Dane. You know, it'd be cool for someone else to win, but I'm like, nah, it will be cooler if he doesn't stop losing. I think that's <laughs> more interesting than someone coming in and winning. Um, like when we were at North Fork, and I, I was, I was at, I was doing safety and just watching Morley. I was like, oh my gosh, like this is so cool. Like this is a contest and other people too. But I remember just watching Morley from where I could. He's just so relaxed, and there's no intensity in his face or in his body or in his boat. <clears throat> and I'm like, oh, this is cool. And I was like, yeah, but like, I want Joe to win, but I also don't want Dane to lose. So he's got, and I'm I'm like that. And you know, we on the Zam we'd be doing um, kickflips or something. And you're just like watching, like it's gonna happen. Like he's going to do something that I haven't seen done before. Or the boat's going to get further into the air than I've seen. Um, so I'm like mentally, yeah, I'm just like, I'm a, I'm a fan for sure. And I like paddling with him cause I can learn, uh, just like watching his, his forward strokes. And I, I try to watch cause I'm interested in the forward stroke. I'm watching like how long his paddles in the water. I try to watch him and compare it to what he said before to see like what is theory in his head and what actually happens when his hands hitting the water. Um, but yeah, paddling with him on your EG, anybody, uh, Kyle Hall is sick to paddle with. Like it you just, I like to watch, watch them as much as I can. Who's um, technically the best paddler you've paddled with a whitewater paddler. I don't know. Like where do you take the most pleasure watching? It's, it's it's a mix of like when if you do a, like a race day with Kyle it's like he, he jokes around like if it's under f four minutes or if it's under five minutes he's like I've got it he's like I can compete but once it gets longer he doesn't he doesn't like doing longer endurance um, Dane Dane and Sven I would put in the same category uh, the second time I ran the little white with Sven, which would be, you know, under five foot, higher than four and a half. Uh, we took him down once. And on the next run, I was in front because I had all this experience. But he kept tapping my 
stern. And I just pulled over and was like, whatever, dude. And he didn't need to see. He didn't need to rely on the laps that he had mm. to be comfortable. He was comfortable because of what he could see in front of him. And I see that in Dane as well. They have a similar, they can take a lot in and then execute a line that's as smooth as if it was the 10th time they've run it in a row. Um, and then Anuel just has a, <clears throat> he's pretty effortless, but he, he's like intense. He doesn't come across as intense, but with the way he paddles, I think he's, he's pretty intense, but it, that intensity comes out in, in strength and being online and in his confidence. Um, but those three, is that three or four? Like EG, Anuel, Sven, and, and Dane. Um, those are the people who you get to see, like, like whether I'm paddling with them or more importantly when I'm not, I get to see footage of them kayaking. There's other people who are, you know, so good, but I'm not paddling with them and I don't see footage of it. So I just don't have, I don't spend as much time watching and paying attention. If you were teaching a class, if you had like a clinic here <clears throat> and you covered the topic of solving these insecurities and arriving at a place of awareness, how would you explain someone to do that? Like, is there a tip? Is there something that you've learned that you can talk yourself into that confidence and awareness? Yeah, I think working backwards and, and not just from like the Eddie at the bottom, but sometimes you're like, okay, what's my goal? My goal is to be at the river right bottom eddy with a feeling of, of having paddled that rapid to my, to my ability and it going well. And you go, you like to find the line, you can go back through that to the top eddy where you'd peel out. <clears throat> but most, like when you're insecure about something, you have to ask, I think you have to ask like why, or if you're afraid of something, I'm afraid of that hole. Like, why are you afraid of that hole? Cause if I go into it, I don't know how I would, or I don't think I'll come out of it. Or if I go into it, I don't know how to get out of it. That's a problem. If you don't know how to get out of it, if you don't think you'll come out of it, but you know how you would start to try getting out of it. Like you look at the hole and look, okay, if I go this way, if I go this way, like where's the water coming out of the hole? And then, and then when there's a sticking point like that, like zoom out and be like, is it worth it? How badly do I want to start at the top and end up at the bottom and zoom back in on that hole? And, and then the big, I think the big thing is, why are you afraid? Like, why are you afraid is easier to answer than why you are afraid and what you are afraid of can be easy to answer, but the actual risks of that fear coming true are harder to answer because then you have to say like, oh, I'm not, I don't know for certain that it's going to be okay. <laughs> and if all you're risking is a swim, like the, like, what are you then like things go wrong? Like, is your like life at risk? Are you at risk of bouncing down rocks or is it just uncomfortable? You're at risk of basically having to hold your breath not dying most likely but holding your breath and having that awful feeling of like when you miss rolls it doesn't take missing more than one roll for the awful feeling to start and how big that feeling is depends like sometimes it's very small and it takes time to grow other times it's you miss one roll and it just like that's all there is is this feeling and that's why you see people they don't even miss a roll and start carping they just carp like they just they're just like fighting to get their head above water and and if you it's it's tough like i it's it's mainly holes i think that that really freak people out because you're you're stuck um but i think having a having a part of your process being uh like this act of identifying what you're afraid of and why because you could be just afraid of it because your last run wasn't good. You could be afraid of it because you've never done it before. Uh, you could be afraid of it because of someone else's experience. 
and you can be afraid of it because it's the one I like is when you're afraid of it because you know you're going to do it. And <laughs> at the end of this, you're like, so you have this fear that you have to manage and you can't ignore it, but you have to, because you have to bring it with you, but you can't let it take over your body. You can't let it uh, take over your reactions. And, and when you, when you go through all that, you're like, hey, what am I actually risking? That's a tough one to answer, but the, and it's different for everybody. Like the, you could be risking a shoulder coming out because you have had a shoulder come out. But what I find is like what you're actually risking when it involves pain or not being able to breathe, then you have to think about the pain and not being able to breathe and how likely it is, how unlikely it is, what you need to do to avoid that. And then all of that comes into this yes or no, which is, like, what are you willing to risk for that reward, and how big, how important is that reward? Um, when we were growing up, uh, McEwen was our mentor, and he would always say, "If if you're afraid of, if you're afraid to run a rapid just because you're afraid, then you should do it. So if you're afraid of getting hurt, then you should probably really think about it more. That's been good advice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No one wants to get hurt. It sucks. <laughs> what about it seems like you've uh i want to get into this chilco trip that you did 30 hours on the chilco at some point but before we talk about that trip well go ahead and tell me about i i, I want to get into the basics of endurance there's a level of clarity and emotion that goes along with endurance things you know it triggers like emotions i don't know if you've experienced any of these um it's 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 one thing to do something fresh and to do it quick and to do it once but to repeat it over a certain amount of time and then make it longer and then you start diving into not only muscle fatigue but you get into sleep deprivation and you, you really kind of find this place it's a it's a hard kind of place to get to but it's oddly satisfying for me um when it comes to endurance paddling what's what's your take on it like what what inspired you to do this 30 hours on the Chilco? And I want to hear about that, but I, I kind of want your take on endurance paddling before we get into that. I think in the same way that when you, when I see something impressive, another thing that I realized about myself was like, I'm a, I don't know if there's a better term, but like a hero, I always, I've always had heroes. I call it like hero worshiping. Like I've always had heroes in it. They, it seemed either either from a movie, like you watch a movie when you're a kid, it's like, I want to be like that person. Or even being, even as shallow as like, I want to look like that. Or I want to do sports that well. And then it was skateboarding and snowboarding and then kayaking. So I always had skateboarding heroes, snowboarding heroes, kayaking heroes. And now with, I'm definitely within this age group where endurance I think it's not just because of what I look at. I think it's a, the age that I'm in is I'm 34 and that's a, I think a common age that people are, are their bodies are good for endurance, but I think your mind is also better for it. And when I would watch, you know, like marathons don't really interest me that much and even half marathons or whatever, like the, the, then you, I started hearing about ultra marathons and that was intriguing. Cause like, that is so cool. It's so hard. It's, and I didn't understand it. And like, you can, what you can under, it's like, why, why is the drainage ditch a guaranteed vi viral video is because you can understand the speed basically and the sounds and the hooting and hollering. Like you, you don't need to kayak to understand how fast it's going and you don't need to be a runner or have, have run a half or a full marathon to understand how hard it would be for yourself to do something for 12 hours straight or 24 hours straight or 36 hours straight, whatever it is. And there's, um, there's a podcast on Joe Rogan with uh, Courtney DeWalter and she's just, it's just so cool what she's done, uh, like finishing races 12 hours 
ahead of, you know, the person, the second place finisher. But she says she always stays for the end of the race because that's when the true warriors come in. Uh, people who she'll do something in however many hours and then people are coming in like at the four day mark. And she's like, that's harder. Like, like it's harder to be out there that long. And cause, cause you're in your head three times as long as she is or something. Um, and Courtney, she wins the races outright. Yeah. I mean, she she beats the boys, you know, like mm -hmm. and the longer it is. So that whole world is just, I find it fascinating and, uh, I've watched a lot, pretty much everything I can find about her, but there's this other guy, Rob Carr, who he's done these races where it's just, it's kind of cool to see the different types of people who are doing them. And again, it, I, I think that my interest in it came from um, being just really impressed by the people who have done them and kind of wanting wanting that and either like wanting the experience but also i know part of me wants the accolade of having done something um that i look at as being impressive and in kayaking it's uh it was nice to start doing these things kind of slowly and to feel good about it like running the stikin twice in the day i like that because i wanted i thought okay i'm gonna run site z twice in a day that's cool and one of those runs, I'm plugging the hole. And I did. And I'm like, I'm going to run all these rapids twice. I was like, that's that's neat. It's like, I'm going to run this river twice instead of once in three days or once in two days. Um, I like that digestion. All that, all that digestion. And then, you know, the you pay attention to like team beer running the grand Canyon in 34 hours. It's like, Holy shit. That's <laughs> and, and, uh, I can't, I don't know his name off the top of my head, but the, the record, the official world record holder for 24 hours paddled in a, in a kayak on a river up on the Yukon. Um, you know, his, the amount of kilometers he put into that, 24 hours i also just can't pull that number up and then but like i liked reading about it and and todd brendan Oniol, and tyler running that section of the middle fork uh like 460 kilometers i think around there in 24 hours so it's just it's like what do you go through and i like the idea of 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 not quitting versus quitting and towards the end of my trip in Africa, I got my hands on this rowing machine and uh, I was supposed to, I was just going to do 2,500 and that went by quick. So I thought, okay, I'm just going to push for 10,000 meters and see how, see if I can get it close to 40 minutes. Cause that was my friend whose rower it was said it, that's hard to do. And I ended up like physically being in a place that I have, I don't get to like my heart rate, in my breathing but also i've never wanted and i pushed and I, I was like 40 i was under 41 minutes and then at the end of my i borrowed his machine and i wanted to get under 40 minutes and I, my heart rate was in according to the watch i wear in zone five for like uh 26 minutes and it was just like it's like oh my god this is brutal and i'm in africa too eh? so like <laughs> it's hot and and I quit and it was this amazing thing to witness because I was like like I was audible I had like 700 meters left or something and I hadn't made a lot of endurance to me too is again like the conversations you have in your head you're like should I get out here should I how do I you're basically like how do I not do what I've set out to do and <laughs> when I'm on the rowing machine and I'm looking at all the numbers in front of me and I'm like, okay, what am I, what do I do here? Like, do I, do I make it to 10,000 no matter what the time? And I decided, no, like I'm going to stop at 40 minutes and then I'll have this amount of meters that I failed because I could tell I wasn't going to be under. And that 700 meters to go, 38 minutes, whatever, I just put the thing down. And I was like, wow, that I didn't even decide to do that. It was like, 
uh, I was taking care of myself. <laughs> it was crazy <laughs> to quit and not having thought of quitting. So I think a lot of endurance, the intrigue is, is again, knowing what can be done and seeing if you are someone who can do it. And a lot of that ends up in your head, I think, because it, as intense as it can get, most of the GoPro I have from the Chilco, Chilco, and Fraser is it's me like leaning in my boat. You know what I mean? And some of it <laughs> was intense, but like <laughs> I, when I'm paddling and my arms are up, like you're not moving fast, but the intensity that you feel in your mind and your body is high. And I, I just am into it. <sighs> what, what about the sleep deprivation? That was cool. Uh, the I, I put on for that I've never had I've never felt that before and I, yeah I've heard about it read about it and well real quick what's what's the trip a lot of people out there don't know anything about this what did you do exactly well I wanted I wanted to try doing anything well not anything I wanted to be kayaking for 24 hours and I was thinking about doing it in the ocean um, and I actually spoke to Nate Klima I was like yeah man I don't want to go do this in the ocean, but I'm, I just want to stay up and move for 24 hours. And he, he reminded me and he told me, go, go do the Chilco, Chilco and Fraser, which is, so the, there's a lake in Northwestern ish BC called Chilco Lake. And that's the headwaters of the Chilco, uh, which I can't remember how many kilometers that is. And then it confluences and becomes the Chilcotin, which hits the Fraser river, which is one of the bigger, uh, rivers in in BC that kind of goes north to south and then right to Vancouver. And what kind of white water are we talking about? The Chilco. By the time you hit the Fraser, I was at like 240 kilometers, I think. So um, the Chilcotin had about 150 to 250 cumex. So class what? Class. I mean, this one you could. It'll be class five for somebody, class three for some. It's like class three to five, depending on how experienced you are. Um, but it's probably a class four run if, if someone... What do you mean how it. experienced you are? Usually class five is class five. Because uh, you could... It's like... Situ, I, I look at it as situational. Like you, it's, it's continuous cold and the rapids aren't small. So maybe it's class five. But if it's daytime and you've been kayaking for 20 years you're not going to be like scouting anything like it's a mm-hmm. class five, you know, it's in the class five spectrum. Sure. But all right. Um, and the Chilco was, you know, it's a lake to, I guess there's, there's debris to worry about. Um, it's beautiful. It's really cool. Typ- I think typically people do a five to seven day trip and it's rafted. Um, there's a couple canyons on the Chilcotin and, and the, so when you get off the Chilcotin and you confluence with the Fraser at that point, I had about, um, 5,000 Cumex in the Fraser, I think, <clears throat> which grew and grew until you take on the Thompson. And then I was in about 7,200 Cumex, which, which is, yeah, the, that's a lot. Like that's <laughs> no one, very few people paddle in that amount of, of water. Uh, especially when there's rapids in it in my experience like the highest volume outside of the congo which is like way different that's the highest volume i've been in and then the rest would be falling into some of the bigger river systems in quebec that are get up to over a thousand and like rarely rarely into two thousand um and when you get so at that people, flow you're fighting swirlies eddy line yeah you know it's like even if there's not a rapid, you're fighting something. It seems like. Yeah. And so you, in 24 hours, you went from what like you did. You did all three. Yeah. So my, and this, I started with like a moving target of goals. You know, I, I had a, a friend who was helping me with shuttle and because there, we, there were all these points where the road either crosses the river or he could access and he was going to, kind of he wanted to be at those points to take photos or or videos were you self-support though beyond that yeah um so he so i had all these potential exits 
because as soon as I was mm. paddling, you know, through a night or for longer than I ever had, or if I had some other issue, uh, I was worried about losing energy just from like a nutrition standpoint because I've never done anything like that. So I had all these exits, which was harder in my head because then I, I knew how easy it would be to stop. And I put on it. So I, I put on in Choco Lake with the idea of getting to Hope, BC, which would be 515 kilometers ish. Um, I'd scouted on the drive up, I'd scouted every big rapid that I identified from Google Earth. And except for one, this landslide that you can't really get to, a new rapid. So as I started, I just, I, I picked 10 landmarks that I knew roughly the mile marker for, if you will. And I just memorized those 10 things. So I could, I just said, I just wrote them down a bunch of times and said them in my head so that I always had, had them to think about and know where I was roughly in the overall effort. So I put on, I wanted to put on at one, it ended up being two with the plan being that I would arrive at this landslide with daylight and not have to deal with that at nighttime. So I paddled through the day, it got dark, paddled through a lot of cool canyons and beautiful white water at night on the Chilcotin. Do you have a and light or full moon or anything? How were you navigating? Um, <clears throat> I had a headlamp, but the, and it's a good headlamp. It's uh, super bright. I had an extra battery and but if it was on and I was in whitewater, it would just reflect. The whitewater would reflect light back. So I kept it off in, um, a lot of the time. And you could hear, if it got loud, I'd turn it on because I wanted to see. But sometimes you could just hear, like, I could hear that I was close to shore. So I would move away from the sound. Or, like, if, if any wood or anything, you'd hear it before you'd see it. Um, or kind of like going on and off for that. But on the Fraser... I could, it was spooky to enter the Fraser and just have the whole, like all your, the sensations underneath you change so quickly. Um, but on the Fraser, it was, it was nice to, I could turn it on, but I didn't need it. But the same thing, you could hear a boil, you could hear a whirlpool. Um, so I was just trying to stay in the middle. And the light came up and I hit the, <clears throat> the landslide at like 6.30 in the morning. Um, there's a road there because this thing slid and the salmon couldn't get up it. So they've been doing a lot of work there trying to create passage for fish. So I could have gotten out and walked around the whole thing, but I, my curiosity pulled me to the last corner that I could, I, I could see around and I just, I knew if I turned the next corner, I'd be running it. And then I carried my shit way up this like goat path, scramble, scouted the rapid, and I, I was torn about being respectful to the landslide and anyone who might see me by continuing to walk, which looked like it would take a lot of time. But it was so early, I just I went down a different path and ran it. And it was, it was really exciting. It was a big rapid to run in a green boat. Um, and from there, that was the grind that whole next day. It was just grinding, uh, running the landmark rapids and keeping that green boat from turning around. I flipped once. I was super bummed. It's the only flip I had. Uh, this whirlpool grabbed the stern when I was like leaning back. <laughs> Did yeah. you make it to hope? No, I quit. I quit. <laughs> that's, the, that's the end. Of, you quit. That's the story. I quit. Um, God. Yeah, there's bridge. Why bridge didn't River you talk Rapids. to that buddy of yours? And <laughs> yeah. I uh, I made it through Bridge River Rapids, and from there down, yeah, just like paddling hard. Then there's this this really tight pinch in the river, that was scary. And what's cool, so sleep wise, I could um I could relax, and fall asleep. Like I would drift drift asleep, and as soon as I would lose balance, I my head would come up. So I kept doing. It was kind of fun to just be like, this is crazy to be so tired that. All I have to do is close my eyes and all like goes off. <clears throat> and then it's called uh, the gates. What's it called? Hell's Gate. 
the whole the 7200 QMAX going through this thing and it was wild but you get to a rapid and I have all the energy all the muscle power I need to do it I really liked that too um, it makes me not want to try to do anything on the Yukon because you'd have no rapids to excite you and to wake you up. <laughs> um, and I went through that and I'm getting close to the end and yeah, this, this quit moment. <clears throat> so as far as like what I felt on my body, I was getting a lot of abrasion on the back of my armpits. Um, and my, I'd worn a heart rate monitor and I guess what people do is they put on this stuff called boob lube. I didn't know this. Uh, so the heart rate monitor was just like wearing on me. Uh, so that was very uncomfortable. You I know, saw I some wet. pictures of that. Yeah. The, <laughs> everything was just like those things were creeping in and becoming more important. Like my uncomfort was becoming a bigger deal. And I was coming up on the last rapid, which was nothing difficult, but to be, to be in the right spot and to stay away from these massive eddy lines and whirlpools. And there was an island that marked this rapid and I saw this island and it was <clears throat> a false. It's like when you're on the Sikkim and you're like, you're like, Oh, this is, this is whole day Chicago. No, it's not. No, it's not. So you're in this, you're always, it's like these false, you're so excited and you're so nervous that you, you keep thinking you're there and you're not there. And I thought it was there and I started getting confused and I was like, ah, I don't know what to do. And then I, I went to shore and I checked my phone. And I had service. I looked at the map, and all the, I just I was so clouded with my judgment because I wanted to stop that I decided I couldn't remember the line and that I had to get out. <laughs> so I ran, I paddled down a little bit further. I got out, I texted my friend, and um, I was I was far from the start of that rapid. I was about four kilometers from the bottom of it. And I texted him, I was like, dude, I'm getting out. And as soon as I took off my dry suit, I was like, you just quit. Like, it's, 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 it's like <laughs> a leaf of over and the dry suit gasket was off of my neck. And I was just like, like the, the line of the rapid came back to me in a second. And, I was like, <laughs> <laughs> and that was uh, 485 kilometers in 32 hours. Amazing. I, oh, wait, no, uh, 29 hours. <clears throat> so, Isn't that a crazy place? Yeah, you know, it's like, it was cool. why do you want to be there? But you kind of like it. Oh, that's awesome. That's a sick story. I have to pee. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. I'll tell you what. So, be thinking of a rant and a rave while you pee. Okay. All right, <clears throat> guys. So, I say we take this time. Should we just interject a couple listener mails here, or should I just edit this out and we go right into rants and raves? We are. One hour, 52 minutes in. Thank you. You're the boss. All right. Oh. I don't know if I can jump into any of these listener mails right here. The only one that I would like to kind of touch on here, and we can get to all these in a later show because there are some good ones here, but what about, and I specifically want to throw this to you, Lewis, what about the custom outfitting here? Do you remember that uh, one? Vaguely. I mean, I don't know. It just looked like somebody had offered his boat. Well, I mean, he took a hodgepodge <laughs> of like several Aww. different. Raymond. Ray was going to be so disappointed. Man. I'm glad to see he kept the IR ratchets in there. That's good. It keeps, he keeps us in the, in the loop. I appreciate that. Yeah. So basically, he's got a Liquid Logic boat. He, re- he removed the badass cover, installed a dagger seat lifter. Drilled half-inch thro- uh, holes throughout the seat for putting fasteners. Custom mini-cell hip pads. Um, removed the, the factory back band and put in, and he raised it up. Um, cut slots into the front of the seat to get a breakdown paddle, which to me was the best idea out of all this that I thought was a, a, a great idea. But, I mean, Raymond put something together there. I mean... I don't know. I mean, is this what your outfit outfitting looks like, Lewis? Um, m- much more simple. That's right. I just do it. I just glue foam in, man. 
it's, it's nothing fancy. <laughs> Lewis's outfitting is fancy. <laughs> well, it's we, not fancy; it's precise. We get a Benny, lot of. I Benny, I don't. I don't know if you've made any adjustments to your approach on boat outfitting, but I've borrowed boats from Benny, and it like when you paddle one of Benny's boats, it's like it makes everything that Benny does seem that much more amazing because it's like finding out that like your favorite skier is wearing boots that are like three sizes too big and missing like two of the buckles. Thank you. That's where I'm at. I take I I will take a boat and paddle it as is, brand new. Like I won't even adjust the foot plane. I'm like it's good enough. I'm starting. I'm I'm now. I'll bring my foot block up. Uh, if I want to be more deliberate, uh, I might start adding some outfitting. I, yeah. I recommend it, man. I think you might yeah. like it. <laughs> I mean, far be it from me, but. <laughs> <laughs> uh well we're two hours in here boys we're gonna have to wrap this one up um benny i could probably go on all day i would love to touch on the congo i mean so like you know you're on the fraser you're in you know a couple hundred thousand cfs two hundred thousand cfs and when you guys were on the congo you were close to a million weren't you yep yeah 1.2 million yeah I mean, that's just a whole new level. And I was there on a previous trip, on a scouting trip right. for that. Yeah. And uh, it was three million when we were there. Yeah. It was not friendly. Anyway. Dude, um, when, when can you come back to the States, man? What's the story? Are you just going to hold it down in Victoria until the stakeout? I, I actually, I got a rowing machine. It's my latest kayak. Um, and it's... Like, I think we can, we can, I just can't use the land border, but I could fly there and then take the land border back. But basically if I travel there and flew back, fly back, then I have to, I have to, you have to do this. They test you at the airport. They take you to a hotel. You await your test results and you take home another test and cumulatively that, that costs around Two thousand bucks. Um, until it's not just the fourteen day quarantine. If you cross the land border, it's just the fourteen day quarantine. Um, but I've I kind of just got a rowing machine instead, <laughs> and I th I could I could kayak to Washington if you want to pick me up in Roche Harbor. Uh, I've kayaked there before from here, <laughs> but it's. Uh, I don't know, man. I'm I'm just gonna to stick it out up here until it's time to head out to Ontario for spring season there. Yeah, sounds reasonable. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to move around these days. Do you have any quarantine when you went to Africa? No, you just kind of was it? Yeah, like yeah, no. <laughs> Got there, hit the river. So, is there anything you guys would like to add before we move on to our closing segment here I mean I have a lot of things I'd like to say but unfortunately I gotta go make dinner for the kids <laughs> <laughs> I'd say that your one day descent of the Stikine was a uh, pretty monumental and definitely anything like that that helps you think differently like i would i would credit that to how i how i think you know and then annual and jared changed how i think and then lomler's changed how i think so it's like all these all these cool things that have been done and that get done are all part of what will be done i think which mm. is really cool all that incremental steps improving one bit after the other yeah I don't know. I just, you know, when you talked about the nods and stares with you and Aniol on the sticking when you guys were out there and you were communicating, but you were never talking and just, I can remember times being in that situation and that's freaking, that's a great place to be, man. It's hard yeah, to it's find cool. that spot. Yeah. All right, boys. Now it's everyone's favorite part of the show. Our rants and raves here to close out the show. This is where your host and our guest go on a little bit of a rant or a little bit of a rave about something they're either all fired up on or getting chafed about. 
So, not to put you on the spot, Benny, but uh, do you have a rant or rave that you'd like to share with our audience? I couldn't think of anything. <laughs> I don't know, dude, I, I don't know like, good examples. Of rant don't overthink it. Yeah, yeah, there's never much thought process that goes into this yeah. one. We'll come back to you in a sec. <laughs> Somebody take the reins there. I have a, I have a quick rave about whitewater kayaking but from a weird angle so we go skiing right up here at mount hood right and it's packed i mean packed you know but the kids want to go so you take them up but then uh you, you know it's the same with every aspect of the outdoor industry it seems like you go backpacking i took my kid backpacking in the summer washington crowded everything was you know super the parking lot was full um you know, we go mountain biking in Post Canyon, same thing. However, however, for the moment, you could still go to run the Little White, and it basically feels like it's 1994 out there. That's the beauty of kayaking. For the moment. Now, I know there's some exceptions. Like, I know you go to the Yonk until you get the spirit. Until you get the spirit, right? And there's someone camping, like, in a Gucci tent. But, uh, oh, my God. Yeah, for the moment, you know, you can still go out and have a legitimate you know, wilderness experience in a kayak relatively close to your house. And it's very unusual in this day and age, but that's also why we're flat broke as kayak gear manufacturers. <clears throat> but it's worth it, right? Sure. <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to rave. I got to rave. I'm going to rave about conspiracy theories. <laughs> <laughs> rave. <laughs> And one in particular. Have you guys heard of the uh, birds aren't real conspiracy theory? Like I have not. Heard that this is this is this, guy. this is a joke. I've no. heard this too, but it's a joke. It's a conspiracy it's, theory. It's Look, joke. It, it made no. me laugh. Let me just tell you about it. So the story is the CIA took, like, killed like twelve billion birds. And basically, <laughs> basically, you know, there was the reason for it is kind of mixed. There's mixed messaging there, but they replaced him with surveillance drones. Uh, there's this whole community about it. They have a solution to everything and like what the eggs are. And it goes into all sorts of things. But this dude, this guy who, who started this thing, his name's Peter. Um, Oh, God dang it. Um, Peter, not McHenry. Peter, uh, oh, it doesn't matter. Anyway, this guy Peter started this. He was like 20 years old. Okay, it was right when conspiracy theories were becoming like the thing, you know, and he starts this thing. And he has had the most creative skits. He's like done billboards and got PR and news teams to interview him. And they get up there and he like kind of says the theory and, and, He's got the best satirical responses to everything that's going on. And it's a conspiracy theory that if you hate conspiracy theories or you love conspiracy theories, he meets in a place where you can still like him, which is kind of hard with conspiracy theories. But anyway, this guy turned this birds aren't real into a multi-million dollar business. And just like every conspiracy theory out there, he's cashing in on it. So I just want to rave about this guy and birds aren't real check out birds aren't com or check out their instagram handle or anything like that it's freaking super good shit that's your rave <laughs> that's my rave i mean it's awesome dude you get, you get into birds aren't real i bought a t-shirt i bought a t-shirt like two years ago what? <laughs> <laughs> lewis bring the heat with a rant that's just a scorched earth rant to get you a ton of hate mail you have the red meat that that the listeners love Yes, I want to, but I'm trying to. I'm trying oh, to come no! a kinder, gentler loose. Oh, I'm letting, I'm letting that go. Nobody Here needs that. No. Just loosen up, take a deep breath, and let it out. <laughs> no, I'm gonna suppress it. <laughs> I got a new rug in the office that I'm gonna oh, about. No, it really, it really ties the room together. Okay. <laughs> that's that's the. The level of preparation that I bring to the rants and raves is frantically Benny, I need looking you to dig the room deep. trying to come up with something. I need you to dig deep, find the dark side, feel the power of the dark side, <laughs> let the <laughs> anger like build you. slowly. Yeah, I was and just go. hanging out with uh, you know, Bran and 
and Dane. Yeah. For so yes. long. Ah, oh, here we go. And we <laughs> and and Isaac Hall too. Uh, oh, that was like the, worst. The, the last little bit of our group. You know, the four of us and And what do uh, they do? Well it's just like <laughs> we, <laughs> we would end up ranting and raving. And I know I know another thing about myself is that I, I can uh, you know, a couple beers and a good mm. friend, they might end up with an earful about <laughs> something. But but I would if I was gonna rant and rave about the same thing, I would say when I was younger, I used to rant about the kayaking industry, but there was nothing supporting my my claims and disillusions of not being of the industry not being big and not making money. But I would say these things because I'd probably heard them said before, not because I actually deserved any money. Um, but now I rave about, I love how small our sport is, uh, even though it's hard to make money in it. I'm sorry as a gear manufacturer, <laughs> but <laughs> also as a kayaker, because I wouldn't change anything about the sport. Um, and if the sport was bigger, then you know there'd be three Danes and three Onials and three EGs, and it would be a lot harder to uh, to make your scratch and a little mark on it. And there'd be 800 people at the parking lot at the Little White. It would look like the Herm parking lot on a Saturday at Mount Hood Meadows. Oh, Wait till, like, next spring break. It's coming, you know. Wait till April, mid-April. It's, it's coming. Yeah, you just you got to keep sharp and stay ahead of the crowds by paddling at higher flows <laughs> in colder air I, I think there's a built-in fear factor in kayaking that's going to keep people out people yeah. just look at kayaking they're like that that's it's the same category as like the guy in the bat suit as i always say the kayaking and the bat suit guy is the same sport to most most people <laughs> the guy you know in the red bull video jumping off some mountain in, in norway or something on oh, the wingsuit the wingsuit yeah <laughs> yeah they're just nuts just some guy yeah. doing a stunt that's kayaking oh, okay. like a guy in a barrel or a kayak or whatever stupid it is stupid Blue, you got no value to add here never come on you got a rant i know you do lay it out there i'm not doing it man do it. it do it why don't you write it write it on a text message and send it to me and i'll read it for you <laughs> <laughs> it's it's repetitive and tired and i'm just gonna gonna sit on my 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 rants okay Come up with right. something for next time. That's very about, anticlimactic. For uh, the next time I'm welcomed onto your show, I'll build up some courage and rant about something. Well, there we, we go. We've got things to talk about. You know, we've got. I mean, we've got to dive into the Congo. We've got other listener questions that we didn't have a chance to get to. Who makes the best whitewater boat right now? The best boat. The best whitewater boat. Like, if you're going to run, maybe not multi-day, but like. Whatever the best class five boat out there right now. I don't know. Like I think you just go into your. People have their own little filters that. No, for they you. Arrive at. Like for you. Me? What's your What's your go-to boat? If If I was allowed one kayak. Mm, that's what I'm getting at right there. Uh, ideally, it would be the Steez. Pull it back a bit. That was for you, Lewis. <laughs> Do it. Do it, Lewis. The Steez. That's your one. Um, your go-to boat. What? I would be happy kayaking. But if I needed something that, like, if if you were like, you get one boat and you have to run these ten things, yeah. and it went from waterfalls to multi days to big water, mm -hmm. I would take mm -hmm. a tuna too. So the steez, I flipped over the scorch, and it had a steez next to it, just for reference. The large scorch, at least the version that we were paddling, identical to the steez hull. I mean, literal. I mean, you'd have to have a, a little ruler out there to measure the differences because they're almost identical. You mean with, with flat you can make spot? It well. Ex it, they are almost identical. I'm not. That's not a. That's not a criticism. Mm. Just to be clear, because a lot of people love the Steez hull, but they look really, really similar. I mean, and also puffy Steez. Puffy Steez, not that's, normal. Steez. It's it's like all I want to paddle now. Like it makes me so happy every time I paddle that boat. It's so good. So another cool thing about paddling with with Dane. Dane was in the new antics and just selling it like. He ran as the water got higher, no problems. Uh, but it's Dane, right? I mean, Dane could be paddling a, a Grumman canoe out there and it'd be like, he looks great. Yeah. But right? it was, 
it was good. So we switched one afternoon. Uh, he got in my steez, puffy steez, and I got in his antics. And he was stern squirting the puffy steez better than I could stern squirt the medium antics, which I'm much too heady, heavy for. It was incredible. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So I'm, I'm now, I used to always say I stopped stern squirting when I turned 14. <laughs> and, and now I, I have to like eat those words and I was just like trying so hard and like my wrist was hurting and my shoulders were hurting even more because I was trying to learn how to stern squirt that thing. <laughs> Oh man! Shut us down, Lewis. All right, go ahead. He's not gonna do it. All right. Well, Benny, thank you so much. That was really good. I know we've been trying to connect. You've been traveling and whatever. So, thank you guys. That was super yeah. Fun. Thanks, dude. Appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. So, dude, how how does how did we tap into the Lululemon font here, dude? How's how did that all come around? Sorry, I know we're shutting down, but I just. Can't quite um, let Benny go. I mean, look at the guy. I mean, how would you not sponsor him? Can we see your hair real quick? Anymore. Yeah, sure. Lots of it. Lots of hair to go around. But yeah, Lulu contracts are over for me. Is um, that by your choosing or their choosing? Yeah, I dropped him. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, they, the opposite. <laughs> They're like consolidating. Uh, Two years ago, I was on the other end of that message where they consolidated the team, and I stayed on. And this year, they consolidated, and then I was not on. But it doesn't. It's all good. Mm. I, I have heaps of clothes to last a lifetime. So, how are you making a go of it? Like, what's your what's your financial plan look like right now? Uh, what let me, What is your tax return? Let's take Let's take a look. What I mean, like you're, I mean, you're, you're. I mean, would you call yourself a career kayaker? Basically, I mean, that's your primary occupation. Yeah, like I've in the past, you know, this last summer I was working for a friend doing like plumbing and gas fitting. A <laughs> uh, couple of years before that, I was like trimming in California, but that's just like little minor bursts of income. And otherwise, I got a job yeah. for you. Oh yeah, yeah. You come down here. We'll get you sewing. I need, I need someone to sew. So it's you, very boring. Yeah. Can I listen to podcasts? And Absolutely. Audiobooks? I would highly okay. recommend it. The trashier, the longer, the better. Can you tell what? Tiger the King order that it's essential that I arrive there? <laughs> yeah. I can, make that happen. can I paddle the little white two to three times per day? <laughs> Two morning can and I, afternoon. Can I work from seven PM until one AM? Only. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Yes. After That's some training. Hard to dawn patrol. We'll work on the hours. We'll work on the hours. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm, I'm, just, I'm trying to do kayaking courses and sell calendars and mugs with my naked body on it, stuff like that. <laughs> Dude, I love the calendar. I, I think it's, you know, maybe maybe it's going to be, uh, maybe there will be options, all nudes, mostly nudes. You know, I can't actually show the bits. Just charge That's a it. premium. Just charge a <laughs> premium for that. I'm telling you. Yeah. Yeah. You could cube out the bits. <laughs> oh, you got a customer right there. <laughs> <laughs> no cubing out the bits. <laughs> <Just full bits. laughs> Again, mixed signals. Uh, I think, yeah, we'll have two. We'll have two editions of the calendar. <laughs> well, Benny, where can uh, our listeners follow you? Buy their buy themselves a whitewater calendar and and learn more about finding their inner sanctity. BennyFuckingMar dot com. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening to Hammer Factor episode 80, and we'll catch you next time.